So thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, t attending tonight. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, at the outset, I do need to make clear that the views I'm going to express tonight are my own, not those of the US government. Um, as, a, uh, as a public research university, Imperial has a natural emphasis on science and technology, but its reputation as well for innovation and consistent top 10 world ranking comes from its ability to turn science also into applications. And uh, as I was looking through some of the history, the discovery of penicillin and development of holography and so many other uh, enormous accomplishments of this, uh, of, of Imperial uh, are so impressive and just make me feel very privileged to be here this evening. When I was invited to speak, I did wonder who is Vincent Briscoe and why is there a lecture and why is it on security? And, um, and happily, I was having a, a conversation with Professor Andrew from, from Cambridge who wrote the history, and he's here with us this evening, that led to the discovery of what Professor Briscoe did uh, to serve the country uh, do a, during two, two world wars and the, the period in between. I'm not sure I want to speculate on what an inorganic chemist might have known about German communications, but um, I'm sure that it's locked away in some secret drawer someplace. So the role of science and its contribution to policy uh, is, is something that I feel is terribly important and perhaps very undervalued. Our ability to have conversations about what presents risk and what options are available to reduce or neutralize risk within the range of the technically possible and in within the, uh, the concept of, of political imperative is necessary, where, whether you're Arthur's Merlin or, uh, or whether you're uh, trying to figure out what the next disruptive technology is. This has been one of my favorite cartoons for many years. Um, am I clicking in the right? Hmm. Okay, there are always more than one way to skin a computer. Um, so just very briefly, uh, what I want to cover tonight. Uh, so a little on historical development of nuclear nonproliferation, um, a discussion about whether our current technical and dialogue-based means for nonproliferation are still appropriate or adequate, uh, and what the international science and policy community must do to maintain and further advance efforts toward nuclear threat reduction. Since we're here under the banner of security uh, more largely, um, I did what I always do uh, when I'm beginning research on a talk, which is I go to the dictionary. So what, what is security? What do, we, what do we view as being secure? So uh, the, the Oxford dictionaries tell us that security originates from the Latin word securus, uh, which uh, means uh, free from care. So state of being free from danger or threat, safety of an organization. I liked the variation that talks about the state of feeling safe, stable, and free from fear or anxiety. That seems to me like a quite good expression of what secure means. So this graphic is a little bit hard to see perhaps, but what I wanted to do was, uh, was find a visual representation of what the last 60 years of the nonproliferation timeline looks like. Um, I was selective in my milestones. Um, many more exist, but I thought it would also be interesting to overlay this on that gray background, which represents the global warhead stockpile inventory. 
And to look at what does this graphic show us? What, what is the story in here? And I think if you look at the red line representing the Russian stockpile against the blue line representing the US stockpile, there are different stories about what each country saw as secure and security uh, in different points of time. So if you go back all the way to the left, you have the IAEA statute approved. So there's, there's our beginning of the 60-year timeline. But not very long after that, we see the Cuban Missile Crisis and the events leading up to that, and a very significant acceleration in the development of the US stockpile. Then we have China's nuclear test. And then we have the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, the NPT in red. And at that point, the US stockpile begins to level off and decline. The Russian stockpile shoots up pretty dramatically all the way to the Glasnost period, where they have uh, then far outpaced the United States in terms of the size of their stockpile. Along the, war, along the, the line, we have the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, SALT I. Um, then we have India's nuclear test. And then, just as we saw the US stockpile go up around the time of the Cuban Missile, missile Crisis, we see the Russian stockpile also accelerating around the time of the Afghan war. When we get to the point where the USSR dissolves, we begin to see the two stockpiles converge. And eventually, we get to the New START Treaty, uh, whose implementation is ongoing, despite geopolitical differences between the US and Russia. And then we, we have the Crimea annexation and uh, a serious decline in relationship between the United States and Russia. So, I am not going to go into a, a, a point by point analysis of this, but I did, th I did think that this was a useful way of picturing the, the, the ebb and flow of events and defense and how they were seen through the eyes of the United States and, and Russia. And then the, the, the delta of the, the gray area includes China, France, India, Israel, North Korea, and Pakistan. So if we take a little bit more detailed look, having a slight technical problem here, and sometimes, ah, there we go. Um, I thought it would be interesting to actually take a, a little bit of a look, uh, and I'm not going to spend much time on this, at some of the granular events of a particular decade. Since I started my, my career in the 1970s, I thought I would pick the 1970s. Um, if, you, uh, if you think about some of the discussion that people have around, around the, the US and, and Russia, um, a lot of nostalgia comes out when people think about the bipolar US-Soviet period, that things were more stable, things are less predictable now, that, um, that, that we're in a, a more tumultuous period than we were then. So I wanted to test that theory by, by doing uh, a little bit of a review of the 1970s. Um, so in 1970, US troops invade Cambodia. Um, the next year, Communist China expels national chi uh, UN seats Communist China and expels national chi nationalist China. Uh, 1972, we have the uh, murder of Israeli uh, athletes at the Olympic Games in Munich. 1973, the Vietnam War ends, but war continues in Cambodia. You have a transition, major transition in Greece, another one in Chile. 
You have the fourth Arab-Israeli conflict and the beginning of a peace process. Somewhat dynamic and a little disturbing. Um, the middle years are not a whole lot better, but they do have a couple of high points. Uh, so we have the first US president to ever resign. Um, we have further turmoil in Southeast Asia, um, including the, uh, the Mayaguez uh, incident where 38 uh, US uh, naval and marine personnel were killed. We have a, we have a positive thing, a, Apollo-Soyuz cooperation, US and, and, uh, and the Soviet Union in space. And then President Ford escapes assassination twice uh, in less than three weeks. Um, 1976, we have Israeli rescue of um, hostages uh, in Uganda. Uh, we have a mystery disease, just like we've had Zika. This was Legionnaire's disease. Uh, in 1977, we do finally hit a high point, and we have the Nuclear Nonproliferation Pact um, signed by 15 countries including the US and USSR. The end of the decade gets kind of a mixed review. Uh, it was pretty active, but uh, we had uh, the transition of Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Uh, we had uh, former Italian Prime Minister Aldo Moro kidnapped and killed. Uh, we had the framework for Middle East peace signed. In 1979, we have continued, we have now a whole decade of turmoil in Southeast Asia. Um, and that also now is going to, in a way, spill over into Afghanistan and continued turmoil uh, elsewhere. We have the signing of the SALT II agreement. That's a good thing. Um, and then we have the Earl of Mountbatten uh, assassinated uh, on a fishing boat off the Irish, Irish coast. Um, US Embassy is seized in Tehran following the um, Islamic Revolution there, and the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. So in terms of nostalgia, it, it was not that. Um, you know, <laughs> the Austin Powers series also takes place in the 1970s, and it's you know, that, that, that image of being very groovy uh, was really not what the 1970s was. I wanted to take a slightly different look. So in addition, if we look at a timeline of terrorism in Europe, this also presents a, an interesting picture, uh, counting the number of deaths caused by, by terrorism incidents between 1970 and 2015, and obviously there are some additions in 2016. So again, we see that even though our current environment seems very unstable and uh, unpredictable, that the decades of the 70s and 80s were actually statistically much worse. Um, you know, there, there have been some truly horrific attacks since the beginning of this decade. Uh, the, the Madrid train bombings in 2004, that was 191 dead the London tube and bus bombings, another 52 dead, 77 dead in, uh, in Norway, uh, and, and so on. But despite these individual large events, there are some who claim that Western Europe is safer now than it was 20, uh, in the 70s or 80s, and possibly one of this, the safest places on the planet. But again, do we actually feel secure? Do we feel safe, stable, and free from fear or anxiety? I, th I think probably not. Um, have we made progress, both in the classical sense of nonproliferation, treaties, arms reductions, et cetera, uh, and, and preventing the, the spread of nuclear weapons? Um, and have we been able to respond to terrorism and the threat of terrorist use of nuclear weapons? Um, if you recall, President Kennedy in 1973 predicted that by 1975, there would be 10 to 20 countries with nuclear weapons. Happily, that did not happen, but um, it's, um, it's something that we still have to 
be very, uh, very vigilant about. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so you can argue that we've made progress. But the, the, the nuclear architecture is constantly being challenged these days. So nuclear power newcomers. If you look at the countries that went back to the IAEA post Fukushima, uh, when pretty much the whole world stopped to review the safety and, um, and security of, of its nuclear expansion plans, the countries that went back first are the countries that have never had nuclear technology before. Um, so to, to us, these are countries that actually present some of the highest risk because they don't have a culture of nuclear safety. They don't have a culture of nuclear security. They, don't, they have not been active custodians of nuclear technology the way the UK, the US, France, and others have been. And so to us, this presents some, some very specific risks. This machine does not like me. There we go. OK, well, everything came up. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> there's also the issue of securing and managing nuclear and radiological materials. In my business, this is the main challenge. Unlike biology and chemistry, where you can use materials that are pretty commonly available to, uh, to develop uh, a, a, a weapon of some sort. In the nuclear sphere, it's all about the material. If you don't have the material, it doesn't matter how good the technology is, how bright the people are. If you have no material, you have no weapon. And so it makes my mission pretty straightforward. But the challenge in the future is going to continue to be that these countries that are ex expanding will require more material. More material gets produced, it travels, risk is in every uh, stage of development within the nuclear fuel cycle. We've learned this with, the, with Iran. As we pulled apart what was happening in Iran and identified all of the different places within the nuclear fuel cycle that you could um, intervene um, to, to develop the capabilities and the materials that you might need for a nuclear weapon. Um, we, we educated ourselves in some very important ways. Uh, it used to be people didn't worry too much about things unless it was highly enriched uranium or plutonium. Now we've learned that we actually have to go back to, uh, to the basics. One of the most innovative parts of the, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is the 25 years of monitoring, mining, and milling of uranium. That's the feedstock. That's where the material comes from. Um, technology development is another one of those areas. Uh, rapidly changing technologies, availability of technologies. Uh, it is so much easier to tap into world-class technology in the global laboratory. And so those, those sorts of skills that we thought were exclusively part of a small club previously are now part of the, the, the world's uh, scientific um, community. So also undermining our global nuclear security are these things of spreading nuclear technology advancement and diffusion, and of course, the continued risk of terrorism. So moving on, so I don't overrun my time here. Um, I would say on balance, we've made progress, but we still aren't at that place where we feel secure. So let's talk a little bit about whether our technical and dialogue base means for nonproliferation are still appropriate. So I, I mentioned the, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, and do I have? Yes. OK. So seated here, that's my secretary, uh, Secretary Moniz. And on this side of the table, you have his counterpart, Dr. Salehi. Um, in a recent interview, 
Secretary Moniz was, uh, was asked about comments that he had made uh, about the idea of the scientist statesman and the role of science in international affairs. And as I, as I tried to demonstrate with my Merlin cartoon at the beginning, science has supported decision making in very important ways for many years, but often that has been advisory. They're often in a separate room, they're sitting back in capital, uh, but they aren't actually sitting side by side at the negotiating table. This was different. Um, the, the negotiations started off with the foreign ministers, and it quickly became evident that the complexity of the issues that had to be addressed were going to require more than diplomatic expertise. You had to have the scientists at the table, not just standing on the side and advising. Um, if, you, if you read through the, the whole JCPOA, it, it's, it is really stunning in its technical complexity. <clears throat> There's an annex that has two pages of, uh, of detailed parameters, technical parameters, for the redesign, the modernization of the Iraq heavy water reactor. I, I don't think I've ever seen another agreement that goes into quite that much detail on that, you know, on a single item. And then that's repeated at, you know, for different topics in, in the, um, in the, um, in the uh, JCPOA. So, what was really interesting, though, is that the last push in the negotiation, it was really hard. It was almost three weeks up every single day, meeting and negotiating, meeting and negotiating. And so during that whole period, Secretary Moniz and Secretary Kerry worked together as a team. And it was stressful. Um, you know, this, this was the end game. And it, there wasn't going to be another extension. If you remember, the negotiation got extended and extended and extended. And instead of causing a problem and impinging on the relationship, it actually just brought them into a closer partnership. And so, you know, it's, it's really important uh, in, in a situation like this to be able to respect each other's capabilities, respect what each other brings, both across the table and on the same side of the, side of the table as well. But you know, in, in, in almost every situation we have, every big challenge that we confront these days has some sort of science or technical underpinning. There's almost nothing that you can, you can look at in the newspaper, whether it's climate change or nuclear nonproliferation, that doesn't have science and technology at its, at its heart. The, the days are gone when policymakers can just sit around and decide things, because when they do, that's usually where things go wrong. Um, and I just want to show, share a few other examples. So this is um, for uh, the JCPOA. So the policy was to keep nuclear, the, the, the Iran nuclear program strictly peaceful. So the challenge was how do you limit uranium production um, both in terms of amount and, more importantly, the enrichment level. Um, so this blue box here is called an online enrichment monitor. It was something that, uh, that our laboratories originally developed for the, uh, the HEU downblending program we had with Russia. That, that was downblending 500 metric tons of uh, defense origin, highly enriched uranium. And what was unique about this, detecting highly enriched uranium is, you know, and determining enrichment is, is nothing novel. What was novel about this is, this is, this is a process flow pipe. So what this does is it measures the enrichment during the process. You don't have to stop the process. So uh, for, for any kind of bulk processing, uh, uh, uranium facility, this actually becomes really uh, attractive. And uh, it's sealed, it's, it's got fiber optic cable that, that continuously transmits information about what's going through it. 
Um, I talked about minimizing uh, weapons grade plutonium. So the policy is reduce the amount of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, weapons grade ATU. So the, the policy is reduce the amount in circulation worldwide. Why is that a problem? Because a lot of research reactors and medical isotope reactors still use highly enriched uranium. They're high performance reactors both in Europe and the United States. So how do you fix that problem? <laughs> I'm going to wait for this to try to catch up. Okay, that caught up too far. There, okay. Um, so to solve this problem, well, it, it was another really uh, interesting science project. We had to develop new low enriched uranium, high density fuels. So in other words, we had to squeeze enough uranium into, into the, the fuel in order to generate the number of neutrons needed to, uh, to support the performance of the, of the reactor. Um, it's a lot harder than it might sound. Uh, but we're making progress, and uh, you know it will allow us to then convert all of the remaining research reactors uh, with those important missions. Okay, I know it went forward before. I'm not sure if our technical help can, uh, okay, all right. It... All right, hopefully this won't go charging forward on me. So um, last example, prevent nuclear material from being stolen. Uh, the uh, challenge is how do you in a resource constrained environment develop sustainable layered security and of course, developing new technical, new, new detection technologies and, and uh, effectiveness multipliers is how we've solved that problem. Um, moving forward, I would argue that we've improved the relationship between science and policy, but we need to think about how we can make that a more deliberate relationship. How do we have a habit of discussion between those communities? So, one of those venues, I think, is in universities, where you have people who are working in all kinds of different, different disciplines. I visit universities as often as I can. Um, it's one way of escaping Washington, but it's also a way of refreshing your brain cells and, and seeing and hearing exciting new things. Um, many of the students I see are working in nonproliferation policy, but also in the science and technology that supports nonproliferation. And my challenge to them is what can they do to find ways to work together, to challenge each other, to cross train? Um, we've talked about doing scenario based exercises. You know, can you take an actual nonproliferation concept or an idea or a challenge and form teams and do it even as a competition uh, to see who can come up with the most innovative partnerships to solve problems. Can you write a wiki treaty? Just like you have a Wikipedia entry, um, can you start a treaty and then have people join in and modify the treaty online? and figure out how do, you, how do you get past certain kinds of challenges and, and problems. The what that they do is not nearly as important as the fact that they are doing something together. And this again is developing that habit of, of talking across disciplines that then hopefully would carry into their, 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 uh, their further careers. This is something that we have done uh, in my organization. And uh, it's a, uh, a, a, it is a consortia, these three here. We have our, our three consortia. And what they try to do is close this cycle here, policy, 
Well, that comes out of my R&D uh, office in terms of a technical roadmap. This is, this is the problem. This is how we are systematically going to attack that problem. That then goes out to the science community. And they're asked, OK, this is what we want to do. They bring in the academic community, and then hopefully, eventually, the industry community. Um, plastic scintillator technology, I think, is a great example of this. Uh, something that we've been trying to figure out is, in terms of radiation detection, how can you turn every person who walks around a major port or an airport or some place where there might be material transiting, how can you turn every person into a radiation detection piece of equipment? Well, you can if you can put something on their belt. Um, but you can only do that if you can get the cost down and get it small enough. So it becomes a, both a technical and an engineering challenge. And you know, these are, this is one of the ways that we have developed of trying to draw our university community through a competitive process into what we do in our laboratories. And it's turned out to be fantastically uh, successful. Uh, we're already hiring many of the people uh, who are participating in the universities. In the summers, they get to do fellowships at our national laboratories and work side by side with our best scientists. But our scientists also have the advantage of interacting with the students and hearing about what they're thinking, hearing about you know, what is happening in cutting edge science in the academic community, um, which you know, if you're stuck off in a national laboratory uh, in the middle of New Mexico, you might not be as interactive with the academic communities uh, across the country as uh, you might like. So again, uh, I, I see trends being encouraging, but more is needed. And in particular, although I've talked about the scientist statesman, it, it bothers me a little bit that we seem to always expect the scientists to be the ones who reach across the chasm to the policy community. I'd like to know, where, where are these statesman scientists? Where are the people in policy, including at the university level, who understand that today's problems need so much science and technology brought into them as part of the solution set, that it's also their responsibility to learn a little bit, to become conversant in science. Not, not to get a PhD in physics, but to understand enough basic science that they can ask the right questions um, and, and to be willing to pick up some mentors along the way who will be willing to teach them a little bit. I've, I, have, uh, you know, I have been asked uh, where I studied biology, um, what my chemistry degree is. I've, I've, I don't have degrees in chemistry and biology, but I've had some extraordinarily patient people who've been willing to sit down with me and explain their science and why it's important. Um, and that's, that's something uh, that I think that universities not only can, but have to contribute to, because that's where it all begins. That's where the, the, um, the, the mixing and the mingling and the creativity can start. So I want to conclude, if I can get my slides forward, there we go, uh, with just a few words on international policy and science community and how do we reduce nuclear threat going forward. So this is, this is one of my favorite titles. Did a thermostat break the internet? Uh, this actually is the title of a congressional research article that appeared about 10 days ago after the, um, the uh, significant attack that disabled Twitter and Reddit and Amazon and, and so forth. And um, if I were to ask you, which has greater computing power, the two old IBM AT286s on the left or this really nice looking refrigerator on the right? And since you're a really smart group of people, I'm sure you got the answer right. It's, it's this guy here. 
Um, three internal cameras that track what you eat, what's in your refrigerator, keep a running inventory, generate recipes for you, uh, track what are your most popular foods, uh, Bluetooth enabled so they can act, so it can actually communicate to your computer and send a grocery order to uh, your local Tesco for delivery or pickup. Uh, and Wi-Fi connected to your home entertainment system, which you can program uh, the entire house from your kitchen while you're cooking. It doesn't quite cook for you, but it does everything else. <laughs> so when, when this attack happened a short time ago, it wasn't because there was some horrible new you know, thing that got thrown at the internet. No, it was just an old piece of malware. And they figured out how to form a, what's called a botnet, right? So it's, it's programmable logic in this, in your home surveillance you know, uh, camera that's watching your baby sleep. It's the box that sits on top of your television. It's all of those things that, that, that are part of everyday life that have the ability to be vulnerable. And, and so we, we look at these things, and, uh, and, and this is part of our challenge. Every, every year, Forbes magazine sends its journalists to the computer electronics show in Las Vegas. And every year, after the show, they write an article on the five most disruptive technologies that they've seen. And it's fascinating year by year to track what happens with those technologies. Some of them become commercialized. Some of them fall by the wayside. Um, in the last year or so, they identified not a technology, but the Internet of Things as being one of those coming disruptive forces. And there it is. Um, and it, the, even the terminology is beginning to change. They wrote a, a follow-up article this year, and they changed from Internet of Things to Internet of Everything. And, and that, that now uh, is becoming one of those things that we have to include in our future challenges and threats, is how do we secure ourselves? How do we secure ourselves when we don't even know that it's our refrigerator that's making us insecure and opening attack vectors for all kinds of possible uh, uh, malicious use? So uh, this, this is one of my favorite slides. Is it possible to escape? And it's just my way of trying to demonstrate um, how, how embedded we are in, in this cyber environment. So those of us with smartphones, we wake up in the morning, and what's the first thing we do? We grab the phone, right? Um, if you have an Apple product and you got the latest update, you now have a little icon that says home. You can program all sorts of things in your home, like your refrigerator. Um, if you have a coffee maker, maybe you program your coffee maker before you get out of bed so that by the time you get to the kitchen, you've got your coffee already waiting for you. You maybe uh, pick up your tablet and you read the, the morning news. Uh, then maybe before you leave, you get on VPN and you connect with your office, maybe important email overnight or something like that. Uh, then you jump in your car, which is going to Bluetooth, Bluetooth connect to your phone, right? So you can call your office on the way into work and maybe change some appointments or check on you know, what's, what's happening for the day. And then uh, if, you've, if, you've, oops, if you've got um, Starbucks, Near, near your office, you're supposed to be in another cloud, where you're getting more coffee. Um, I don't know how I can get this. There. OK, so the bottom line point is, before you even get to your desk in the morning, how many points of vulnerability have you exposed yourself to? 
just, just because you're doing the things you do every day. So as we think forward, uh, you know, one of the things we have to do is try to, as best we can, prepare for the unknown or the unexpected. Um, I've talked a little bit about cyber, so I'm not going to go into that much more, but just the, the challenges and the capabilities are growing exponentially in this area. And um, you know, we are seeing the dangers of blended attacks, uh, and there uh, certainly uh, we are concerned about how, how that could affect nuclear facilities. Um, but you know, also nation state use. You know, this is becoming one of those other battlegrounds, very fuzzy, very difficult to define. Not kinetic yet. We haven't figured that part out, but um, certainly with significant danger. Emerging technologies. Um, additive manufacturing has really f fascinated me because our laboratories have just seized this technology, doing all sorts of innovative things. Uh, it's really exciting to see, but this is not a new technology. Additive manufacturing has been around for decades and decades, but I kept asking people the question, why is this just exploded recently? And uh, I was at Los Alamos National Laboratory in, 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 their, um, in their lab, and somebody said, well, the base patents expired. And so the, the, the ingredients, the, you know, the raw ingredients for this technology were now available to the global laboratory. And we just saw this explosion of invention and innovation, some of it for wonderful things like prosthetics. You can customize a prosthetic that would fit just precisely uh, a, a person. But one of the first things that was made was a plastic gun that would evade airport detection through metal detectors. Um, and this, this raises this whole issue, and I, I was just talking to Alice Gast about this uh, a short time ago, is how do we as communities, as policy and technical communities, think together about emerging technologies? How do we think of what controls would be appropriate, what risk those technologies might produce, might, might be present in the future, if we don't think through their potential together now. Because what we don't want to do is inhibit experimentation, creativity, innovation, but at the same time, we don't want to be creating something that uh, without some controls could, in fact, create um, real dangers. And then changes in relationships. I mentioned Russia before. Science always used to be one of those threads that would endure any geopolitical change. Um, and that's really no longer the case. Uh, the, the, the relationship has broken down in some fundamental ways. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to rebuild that. But those kinds of relationships, um, whether it's you know, the UK with, with Europe, whether it's the US with the rest of the world, those changes in relationships can also present enormous risk if we as communities don't think about them together. All right, it will catch up to me. Ah, okay. Um, I'm, I'm a great science fiction fan. I grew up with Star Trek. Um, and this is just one more of my, my little demonstrations. I always thought having a replicator would be one of the most wonderful things in the world. And that's a 3D printed pizza. <laughs> so, you know, just what used to be science fiction is not fiction anymore. It, it's there, it's, it's, it's possible. Um, and, and that's, that's what we need to think about together, is when, when do we cross that line from being science fiction into reality, and when does that reality be something less benign than a pizza?
I think the computer just doesn't like my animations. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm going to close with just a, a last appeal um, on the issue of, of uh, policy and, and, and the technical community. For policymakers, you know, we, we, <laughs> we need to think in a world that, um, that, that is, is real and, and represents what we think we want to have happen. Uh, a lot of times policymakers come up with great ideas. They may not understand what they're talking about. It's your job <laughs> to make sure that they do. Um, but policymakers can also be uh, the ones who champion a policy um, and the technical community can also help encourage bold steps, take big decisions, uh, open up new opportunities. In the other direction, it will come up in a minute, Benefits to the technical community of working with policymakers is policymakers can steer resources and, and drive, uh, drive decisions. Uh, they can help build international communities of support. They can create champions and constituencies. And they can provide accountability. And next time, I'm not going to use as many animations, I think. Um, so let me, let me conclude with just this last slide. Um, I've, I've covered these points before. But you know, if you go back to the title, who's, who's the adversary? The thing that we have to make sure is that, that it's not us, uh, number one. Because it's it's very easy to lose track sometimes. We're you know we're we're heading down an interesting direction of exploration. We have a terrific idea. This is going to be wonderful, and our job, globally, is to not just think about that one application for something, but to take a step back from time to time and think, you know, put the black hat on. If I were somebody who had this technology, and I weren't as nice as I am and as good intentioned as I am, what could I do with this? Could I do something that would not be um, appropriate, would not be responsible science? Um, you know, these challenges that we have are not going to go away. Uh, in, the, in the nuclear nonproliferation area, we're in this for the long term. Um, and so we need this relationship to endure. Um, but we also need those science-informed policy dialogues. And again, it's the complexity of the challenge. Um, no one of us can solve these problems alone. And I would go back to that, that last point I made um, uh, earlier, that the habit of collaboration, the habit of discussion, getting used to not being separate from each other is so vitally important in, in today's environment. Uh, that we just need to find a way to do a better job uh, to make the world safer. That's our goal, after all. So thank you, and I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Thank you, Anne. Uh, I should introduce myself. My name is Chris Hankin. I'm director of the Institute for Security Science and Technology uh, here at Imperial. And before taking questions from the floor, uh, I'd like to offer a formal <laughs> vote of thanks. I'd like to start by apologizing for the technical difficulties <laughs> that you've experienced in your talk. And I assure you that it hasn't detracted from the elegant arguments that you've, uh, you've um, made for the creative uh, interaction between um, scientific and policy communities. Um, and indeed, it's part of the mission of the Global Institutes here at Imperial to engage in that policy discussion and also to help uh, scientists and technologists at the college uh, access those uh, challenges and provide, help to provide solutions. Um, 
As director of ISST, I was delighted that you took some time to talk about the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. Um, one of our biggest achievements this year, I have to say, has been uh, our involvement in a new research hub to look at privacy, trust and security uh, in that context. And uh, my colleague, uh, Emil Lupu, who will join us later, is deputy director of that uh, engagement. It's a 23 million pound initiative. So the UK is taking that area in particular very seriously. Um, you followed the tradition of the, the, the Briscoe lectures in, in delivering a really elegant uh, talk, so thank you very much mm -hmm. for that. Um, and uh, I'd like now to um, open the discussion up for questions from the floor, but before I do so, I'd like to use my prerogative as chair to ask <laughs> the first of those questions. And um, I particularly liked your last um, couple of slides, which looked at the uh, relative benefits to both the policy and the technical communities from okay. this, uh, this dialogue that you've been promoting. Um, I think implicit in your slides, there was one additional um, benefit for the technical community, which you didn't quite bring out in those okay. summary slides, but that is um, what will we find, that that is that uh, our scientists and technologists get access to real and, and um, important challenges that they mm -hmm. might not see if they stay within their, their labs. Um, but uh, again, in the UK context, we often find that access to those problems is slightly inhibited by classification issues. Mm -hmm. And I, I was wondering if you could comment on, on how your integrated university program mm -hmm. uh, actually overcomes some of those challenges. So um, when we develop a basic roadmap, so whether it's verification technologies or uh, improving seismic detection, uh, whatever the topic may be, it's, it's got multiple layers of development. So there's always going to be a basic science component that's, um, that's integral to making additional progress. That's normally where the universities uh, are, are most, um, uh, most involved. But one of the things that, that we have discovered is there's there's so much innovation within university communities. For example, um, one of the University of Michigan projects in, in the verification uh, consortium was to uh, develop a technology that could identify the location of various types of radiological material in a room. So you kind of scan the room and it would identify three or four different samples. So they did that, but then they integrated it into a tablet so that even somebody who had no knowledge of how the, how the, how the, the technology worked could take it and go find. And it would go bloop, bloop, bloop on the map, and then you could walk over and find where it was. So they, they, they used the tools that they had to do something that made it very user friendly, um, and you know, with the thought in mind that okay, if this is going to um, an inspector walking through a nuclear power plant, how do you make it very easy to use, very very simple? Or if this is going to go to um, military in the field. How do I make this something that I don't have to put somebody in three weeks of tra technical training to teach them how to use this tool? So that wasn't necessary. That wasn't part of what we had asked them to do. That was something that came out of the environment because they liked playing with the idea. OK, thank you. So can I open it up to questions from the floor? Uh, the there is a roving mic. Uh, <laughs> there's two people I've seen. So we'll take yeah. the one at the back Maybe first, take, and then yeah. there's one at the front. and. Thank you very much, a really brilliant talk. One question, uh, it, well, I think it's relevant, the um, nuclear testing in the atmosphere, as there was a famous one in 63, and I think France has had some tests since then. Is there, has there, is there any country now testing nuclear weapons in the atmosphere? I, I mean, it seems they're not, but it, uh, could you enlighten me on that? Um, there are not. Um, if, if they were, I guarantee you I would know it. <laughs> because among other things, my, my research and development office is responsible for developing, producing, uh, and testing the 
equipment that flies on satellites to fulfill the responsibility we have had since the Eisenhower administration of detecting any nuclear explosion from the surface of the Earth to the far side of the moon. Um, so we, we are responsible for that technology. Unfortunately, North Korea um, seems quite determined to continue its underground testing program. But again, we, uh, along with the rest of the international community, have been improving the detection technologies that are part of the Comprehensive Nuclear <coughs> Test Ban Treaty, which although not yet entered into force, is actually pretty active in terms of its global monitoring. You're welcome. Uh, oh. Hi. Oh. Sorry, there's, there's, there's another person that Andrew's giving the microphone to at the back there. Yeah, so but if you're we take next, that first, and you're and next. Then, and then you're next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering, uh, to what extent are your agency's core activities uh, influenced by the policy priorities of the administration? Very directly, but I, I would say happily, um, nuclear nonproliferation tends to be a heavily bipartisan issue. It's, there, you know, it's not Republican versus Democrat. Uh, there may be shadings of preference one way or the other, uh, but you know, when, when President Obama was a senator, so he was a junior senator from Illinois, he goes to the Senate and he does what most smart people do. He looks for a mentor. And he looks around at people who are working on interesting and challenging issues, and he sees Senator Richard Lugar. And uh, Dick Lugar, uh, uh, along with uh, former Senator Sam Nunn, at the time the Soviet Union collapsed, created the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, or the Nunn-Lugar Program. And young Senator Obama started traveling with Senator Luger. They would go all, you know, chemical facilities, biological facilities, nuclear facilities all over the former Soviet Union. And through that process, he learned about the importance of maintaining control over nuclear materials. So he becomes president. In 2009, he goes to Prague. He makes his is you know, watermark speech on nuclear security policy and basically lays out my job for me. Um, it's, you know, it, it was you know, really easy. You know, keep, keep the most vulnerable material out of the hands of terrorists. You know, he had a whole laundry list of things. And so we followed that policy ever since. It's not that we weren't doing those things before. It's just that his presidency gave us a lot of extra political energy behind those, those programs. But yes, it does make a difference. David. Thank you. And David Gann, Vice President here at um, Imperial College. Um, I really enjoyed your talk, and I particularly enjoyed the trip down memory lane. I, I started my <laughs> career in the early 80s, and I worked for 20 years at the Science Policy Research Unit at Sussex, and a very good colleague of mine, uh, when we were doing our PhDs, he wrote his PhD on the plutonium cycle. And uh -huh. at that time, there was a very big attempt to build an inventory of plutonium. And I was struck by your data on the warheads, but also that you didn't show any data <laughs> on <laughs> the other stuff. And I, I, I wouldn't expect you necessarily to answer in detail, but I uh -huh. would be curious to know just how important that is these days. Do we know... Um, where um, uh, enriched and, and other um, uh, radio radiological resources are mm -hmm. and who's got them. Um, how important is science in that quest? Mm -hmm. And uh, are we working in the right way to understand that? Mm -hmm. So we do have a pretty good idea of where those materials are. Most highly enriched uranium that is distributed around the, around the world was delivered courtesy of the Atoms for Peace program. Um, uh, I, I have another talk that, that goes into more detail about that, but it was, um, it was really interesting going into the Eisenhower Library archives and researching 
how that, that whole program came together. And he was very involved in writing the, the four you know, principles of the Adams for Peace program. But one of those principles was no country wanting to pursue peaceful uses would ever lack for material. And, um, and if you combine that with kind of the uptick in the Cold War and competition between the United States and Russia for hearts and minds all over the world, um, some of that went out through, you know, under the, under the banner of peaceful uses. And so there were a lot of research reactors that were built all over the world. What's interesting to me is I, I found out through my colleagues who do reactor design, most of those early reactors were in fact low enriched uranium fuel. Until all you scientists got a hold of these reactors and you figured out, you know, if I had a few more neutrons, I could do material science, I could produce medical isotopes, I could do all of this great stuff if I just had some more neutrons, right? And so we went around and converted many of these reactors to highly enriched uranium. And so did the Russians. You know, fast forward about another 15 years and everybody's going, probably wasn't a great idea. <laughs> and, and so, and then we begin to start reversing the trend. But we, we do have a pretty accurate count. We exported about 26.3 metric tons of highly enriched uranium. And we have almost a complete accounting for that. The Russians about another 10 metric tons. So it was pretty significant amounts of material that, that were distributed for peaceful purposes. Um, that's not happening anymore. And in fact, the, the, the stocks of highly enriched uranium are, are declining. Um, plutonium is a, a, a somewhat different case because there are only a limited number of countries that use plutonium in the civil fuel cycle as mixed oxide fuel. So France, uh, Japan has, um, China's looking at it, uh, but you know, that, that comes out of the recycling process. Um, and you know, there again, we're looking at how do you, um, how do you maintain proper control of, over inventories. Japan is a very good example. It has a very large stockpile of civil plutonium um, that it has reprocessed. And currently has a non-accumulation policy that it will not accumulate more plutonium without a pathway for utilization. Um, when you ask about how important <laughs> is the science around this, enormously. Um, again, going back to the JCPOA with Iran, there's a specification in the plan for how many centrifuges they can, they can keep, which was based on a calculation of the production capacity per um, per cascade over periods of time, uh, and how quickly could they get from, say, uh, you know, 3.76% enriched to 20, and then from 20 to highly enriched. And that was, that was a whole series of very, very precise calculations to try to figure out how many, how many centrifuges and how many cascades could they have without getting closer to that magic point. OK, I think we'll just take one more question. Um, and then have... uh, we will be having drinks over behind okay. the lecture theater. Okay. Sorry, I'm told two more questions. Yeah. One here. <laughs> well, and she, she had her hand up uh, a long okay. time ago. <laughs> OK, shall yeah. I go first? Thank you for a wonderful talk. My name is Tristram Riley-Smith from Cambridge University. Fascinated by, <laughs> fascinated by your description of those consortia, and I suspect there's a great deal we could learn from that. But you did talk about the dream of a statesman scientist <laughs> reaching across the chasm. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect our experience would be it's quite tricky to turn a policymaker into a scientist and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what experience you've had of using, as it were, knowledge brokers or honest brokers mm -hmm. to try to help bridge the chasm. Is there anything you could share with us on that? <laughs> well, personally, I think that our current Secretary of Energy is the personification of 
uh, the, 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 the entire package. He's, he is both a, a, an astute policymaker, but he's also a PhD physicist, uh, and he has the ability to blend those two things together extremely effectively. Um, I have found in my career that it is easier to take someone with a science background and a policy interest and help them develop the policy experience that it, that's needed to become a real uh, active member of the policy community. One of my best hires uh, was a, a, uh, a fellow from the American Association for the Advancement of Science who came to my, my office as a fresh PhD from her microbiology lab, and she's currently running the biosecurity function in the White House. You know, she's, she's really brilliant. But she was, she was one of those people who made that transformation. I also hired a microbiologist at the same time who ended up, after a year, going, I got to get back to my lab. I cannot take <laughs> dealing with the randomness and the weird people, and, the, you know, and she just couldn't wait to get home. So it, it takes, it takes a, a certain, certain personality type, a certain curiosity about the intersection of those things. Um, uh, some of my current fellows, I, I, I had one last year. He was just wonderful. I, we were having a brown bag lunch in my office, and everybody was going around uh, explaining why they, were, they had applied for the program. And he said, well, I've done physics my whole life. Then one, one day I, I started wondering why. <laughs> what, 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 what was I doing this for? What, what was it relevant to in a bigger context? And he was very successful as well. So it's finding, it's finding the right people. Uh, but you only find the right people by giving them opportunities to explore. I have a fellow uh, this year who came, uh, came in with an undergraduate degree in economics and then decided that she needed a master's degree in chemistry. Now, that's, that to me is, is, the, is the, the right set of, of intellectual ingredients for, for this breed of, of crossover that we're looking for. Um, Right. There are lots more questions, but we are going to have uh, drinks and informal mixing in the rooms behind the lecture theatre. So um, in the interests of, um, of, of letting people mix and, and, and ask their questions, I think we'll terminate the formal proceedings now with, with another sincere thank you to Anne for a fascinating evening. Thank you.